Thank you. And good evening. Thank you, everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. And I hope that this talk is edifying, interesting, and I hope that we can talk afterwards and you can share your thoughts as well. So I'm here to talk to you about desolation and creation. And I really don't want to talk about all of these dark and depressing topics because it's just such a beautiful day today and had a beautiful drive up here. But this is the topic that we chose. This is what we've prepared. So I'm going to talk to you about a lot of different varieties of spiritual darkness that people can go through and some ideas about how they might affect people in the arts. So there are a wide variety of shadows that haunt the human mind. There's a great variety of types of darkness and desolation that haunt people, especially creative people possibly, although we'll discuss that. And um, I'm going to discuss some of those varieties tonight. And maybe you've been through some of those times of darkness, of grief, of loss, of alienation. Maybe you're even in one of those phases right now. And people have gone through these types of spiritual darkness for at least as long as they have known how to write down their thoughts. And the psalmist writes about one such time at the beginning of Psalm 130 that has come to be known by its Latin title, De Profundis, which is also the title of the piece of music we were just listening to by Arvo Pert, that extremely low voice. So the psalm, here are a couple of verses selected from it. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Now this psalm goes on to end in hope and to end in light, and you can even see that being hinted here in these verses. But just the beginning, out of the depths, we're going to examine some of the depths. And I, this is not what I would call a very scholarly presentation that I'm giving to you now. I haven't used the same rigorous methods of research and so forth that I would ordinarily do you know, for an academic paper or something like that. So I'm going to be sort of skimming in between psychology, devotional thought, philo philosophical ideas and so forth. It's more presenting questions and some tentative ideas rather than me saying this is a definitive argument that I'm making. So what happens when darkness takes an artist is that some of them are able to use this darkness and turn it into beautiful art. Some of them are able to come raging out of their despair to create beautiful, glorious works, and others are silenced. Others in the time of depression can't get out of bed, can't go to work, can't do a thing. So what makes the difference? What makes the difference between someone who's depressed and writes stories about it that then help others because they're expressing the condition so beautifully and someone who can't write at all. What makes the difference between, say, a Beethoven who comes flaming forth from that dark time with a really powerful piece of music and someone else whose name we don't even know because they were not able to come out of it? Well, I don't know. I don't know what makes the difference between those types of people. Um, and I don't have a list of handy tips and tricks for here when you're in the darkness, just do these you know, five steps or 12 steps and you'll be able to create something again. Um, I do have some thoughts about mental health, just ideas, suggestions, which you can ask me about later. I won't be going into that as much, but I really don't know what makes the difference. So instead, I'm just sharing a series of stories, a series of sort of tentative movements towards ideas on this topic. Now, if I'm going to be giving you classifications, taxonomizing these different types of darkness, well, is that helpful either? I don't really know whether it helps to have a series of labels and a series of names for what's going on, but our time period is one of taxonomization. We love to categorize everything, label everything, put it in neat boxes. We like to talk about what caused this and what caused that. We like to see these chains. We like to boil everything down to a gene, a chromosome, a molecule, and so forth. So maybe our ancestors of the Middle Ages would admire us for this drive to categorize. C.S. Lewis wrote about the Middle Ages. There was nothing which medieval people liked better or did better than sorting out and tidying up. Of all of our modern inventions, I suspect that they would most have admired the card index. <laughs> okay, wait, what's a card index? All right. Um, but then again, maybe not. <laughs> 
Maybe we overclassify. Well, before I get to that, let me say, of all of our postmodern inventions, maybe our medieval ancestors would most have admired the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Very organized, very tidy entries, clickable if you get the online version of all the different entries. So it's very highly organized. But perhaps our medieval ancestors would not have admired this either because it has several flaws. It has several problems that work towards not looking at people as a mind, soul, and body unity. So I want to discuss a couple of its problems as a way of sort of getting into our topic tonight. One problem is a drive, a drive towards over-medicalization, towards labeling and categorizing as a mental illness a lot of things that might just be normal. The British Psychological Society wrote an official response to the forthcoming fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and here's what the British Psychological Society had to say about that. The society is concerned that clients and the general public are negatively affected by the continued and continuous medicalization of their natural and normal responses to their experiences, responses which do not reflect illnesses so much as normal individual variation. For instance, in an early draft of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, the forthcoming one, the entries on grief were greatly expanded so that they seemed to be covering almost all normal and natural grief after the loss of a loved one and calling that um, a pathological or an abnormal condition. But there's an equal and opposite problem as well, which we might call the labeling and categorizing and therefore normalizing of sin by giving it a biochemical um, and genetic basis. The British Psychological Society had something to say about this too, although they didn't frame it um, in religious language. The putative diagnoses presented in DSM-5 are clearly based largely on social norms with symptoms that all rely on subjective judgments with little confirmatory physical signs or evidence of biological causation. And how about this last bit here? The criteria are not value-free, but rather reflect current normative social expectations. Now, I have heard a rumor, anecdotally, but I've not yet been able to confirm it, that the new forthcoming fifth edition is actually going to diagnose over 50% of the population with some mental illness, which means, hello, mental illness is the new normal, okay? So the overarching problem then, as I said, with this approach is that it doesn't look at human beings as holistic entities. It tries to break us down into our biological and our physical parts and label each of those parts. So our ancestors of the Middle Ages then would probably not admire this because they had such a beautiful holistic view of the universe and of personhood. They had an extremely complex system in which every part was connected to the whole and everything was vital, it was vivid, it was alive, and it was theologically infused. So every little part had theological meaning as well. So in what I'm going to discuss, I'm hoping to keep the idea of the unity of human personhood there and to start moving into looking at spiritual problems rather than specifically medical problems, even if the American Psych Psychiatric Association might want to label those for us as medical problems. And I also want to say here that um, even though I'm talking specifically about artists, and I'll tend to talk more about literature than other artists just because that's my field, I think that these things probably apply to almost everyone that ideas of, well, can you still be creative when you're in the darkness? They probably just apply to, well, can you do whatever it is that you do um, when you're in the darkness as well? And I'll say a little bit more about that a little later on. So then, starting to get into our discussion then of artists, is it mental illness? Is it varieties of religious desolation? Well, this is another point of confusion because you know that there are stereotypes that artists tend to be more afflicted by mental illness. Here's one study, uh, Kay Redfield Jameson, well this is a popular book, her book um, Touched with Fire, it's not an academic study, it's a popular work. In it she posthumously diagnoses hundreds of poets, writers, composers, and visual artists. Now after they're dead, mind you, she goes back and examines their lives and gives you a very handy oh, index, very orderly with this little uh, code so that you can look at the code and see which artist had either cyclothemia, depression, or bipolar disorder. So you can look up your favorite poet or artist and see what illness they had. Continuing along this idea of this stereotype, Nancy Anderson in her book Journey Through Chaos said that studies of creative individuals also indicate that they have a higher rate of mental illness than a non-creative comparison group. And one more who 
um, supports that same idea. A.M. Ludwig wrote that individuals in the creative arts professions experienced significantly more psychopathology and underwent psychotherapy more frequently than those in other professions. So this sounds like there's scientific evidence then, right? That if any of you are painters, writers, musicians, that you're more likely to develop a mental illness. Well, let's take a look at that a little more closely. I have a suggestion. What if it goes the other way around? What if the popular idea actually has it backwards? What if instead of saying, oh, you're a creative type, so you're likely to develop a mental illness, what if it's more like someone who's maybe predisposed towards a mental illness is more driven to develop his or her creative talents as a means of coping? Isn't that a more positive way to look at it and a more holistic way to look at it? Or let's look at another possible problem in those studies. I don't know if it's a simple binary. Right? Are we really just, are there only two types of people in the world? People who say there are two types of people and people who say there aren't, right? No. Are there really just two types of people, creatives and non-creatives? Whatever that means. Right? I mean, a lot of people um, who are in supposedly non-creative professions are highly proficient in one of the arts as a hobby. As a matter of fact, by profession, I'm an English teacher, right? I don't make money off of my poetry. So I would be considered a person whose art is a hobby rather than a vocation. Does that make me a non-creative because I'm not paid for it? Right? Or does it make me a creative simply because I do it? Here are a couple other ideas about the creative-non-creative -creative binary and breaking that down a little bit. A lot of people in the creative professions pursue their work in what you might call a workmanly fashion. They pursue it as a logical, rational process or as a technical skill to be mastered physically, especially perhaps if you're someone who's presenting someone else's work of art. So say that you are a classical musician and you're playing someone else's compositions rather than composing them yourself. The hours that you spend in the practice room are more of those hours are spent on developing your technical ability, your physical ability, and your memory skills, and so forth. And you're not creative in the sense of making a new work of art, although you are making a new interpretation of it, every time you perform that piece, okay? And furthermore, aren't a lot of so-called non-creatives, don't they employ creativity in their work? Can't you employ imagination as a doctor, a lawyer, a mechanic, or any other field? You can visualize things in new ways, you can look at new ways to put things together. So anyhow, I think that the binary is probably not correct and maybe a more realistic view of humanity would be something more like this. Right? In which case, those studies would be rendered irrelevant because if they arbitrarily divided people down into two groups, creatives and non-creatives, they're already skewing the results. Um, but again, I'm not being scientific here. I'm just presenting some other possible ways of thinking about it. So let's talk a little bit more about the myth of the mad genius or the myth of the mentally ill creative. Keith Sawyer has written a bit about this, and he believes that it is indeed a myth. And he says to his readers, you may believe in some variant of this myth, that creative people are more likely to be mentally ill than non-creative people, artists and writers are more likely to be alcoholics, clinically depressed, or commit suicide. He says, I call this a myth because there's no solid scientific evidence for it. And furthermore, there's a pretty large amount of scientific evidence that creativity is associated with positive moods, happiness, and healthy lives. So overall, I just want to suggest to you not to over-romanticize the idea of the crazy artist, the idea of the artist with mental illness. Mental illness might not help your creativity, and it certainly won't help your relationships. So don't go wishing for it. Here are a few other scholars um, who have also tried to debunk the myth. Judas Schlesinger wrote the insanity hoax that directly challenges the mad genius myth by exposing the pseudoscientific foundation it rests on. She also believes that exceptional minds should be celebrated rather than diagnosed. And then here's one specific study by a, a professor at Temple University, Robert Weisberg. He set out to ask, does madness really heighten creative genius in artists, musicians, and writers? And his answer was, not at all. Now he did one specific study of Robert Schumann, who nowadays would probably be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And he found that while the quantity of Schumann's composition swelled during his manic years, the average quality of his efforts did not change. Mania jacks up the energy level, but it does not give the person access to ideas that he or she would not have had otherwise. 
But now let's really get on to the, um, the topic at hand, the idea of religious or spiritual desolation and the different kinds that there are and how they might affect creative types. First of all is the kind that has traditionally been called melancholy or melancholia, a loss of interest in the outer world, a loss of self-esteem or an anticipation of the loss of one's own life. I think of all the kinds, this is one that's most likely to prevent someone from making creative work. It just involves lethargy, lack of energy, lack of ideas, lack of ability. Sigmund Freud wrote about this in Mourning and Melancholia. Um, he was writing about normal grief, mourning, and then he said it can reach a stage when it becomes pathological, and then it's melancholia. And he said that its distinguishing mental features are a profoundly painful dejection, cessation of interest in the outside world, a loss of the capacity to love, and inhibition of all activity. So obviously that would include the creative activities. A lowering of the self-regarding feelings, sleeplessness and refusal to take nourishment, and an overcoming of the instinct which compels every living thing to cling to life. So when someone is in a melancholy, it's highly unlikely that he or she will be able to make creative works. But afterwards, after coming out of that season, it can be described. It can be captured, it can be written about, um, and it can be captured in works of art. So here's Melancholia by Albrecht Dürer. And um, it's been interpreted many different ways. But among others, there was a tradition that melancholy was specifically an affliction of students or of seekers after knowledge, of anyone who is trying to discover some difficult idea, trying to do research in a complicated field, and is being frustrated in it, is not able to learn that fact or master that task at hand, and so this person falls into a melancholy. And this engraving has specifically been interpreted as being the alchemist at work the seeker after wisdom in a mood of temporary defeat because he has not been able to achieve the philosopher's stone. And so here is possibly the alchemist or the student in the melancholy mood. But did you notice that it said it was a period of temporary defeat? So it's not a permanent stage. And so the hope for the person who is in the melancholy is that it won't last forever and that when you come out of it, you may be able to describe it. And then your descriptions will be valuable either just as works of art or possibly as being helpful for others who are going through it at the time. Now, when the melancholy is tied specifically to a spiritual state, or maybe saying the same thing the other way around, when a person of faith is going through a melancholy, it's often called acedia, Greek word for dullness, apathy, a lack of care, heedlessness, torpor, sloth, listlessness, and carelessness. Kathleen Norris has written about this in her book Acedia and Me, Marriage, Monks, and a Writer's Life, and she gives a distinction that might be helpful. Her idea is that possibly the boundaries between depression and acedia are notoriously fluid, but at the risk of oversimplifying, I would suggest that while depression is an illness treatable by counseling and medication, acedia is a vice that is best countered by spiritual practice and the discipline of prayer. So she does think that this state is a sin, or at least brought on um, by some kind of neglect of spiritual duties. What Sometimes, even if you're not able to create during a period of acedia, you can at least keep a journal. And some people, ha many people have found that journaling is extremely helpful through this time, because if you can't muster the energy to come out of it and produce a finished work, at least you can just write down your thoughts, keep your ideas in a journal for the future. So Soren Kierkegaard is one who kept a journal, and he wrote in 1840, I feel so dull and so completely without joy. My soul is so empty and void that I cannot even conceive what could satisfy it. Oh, not even the blessedness of heaven. And then eight years later, he wrote in retrospect, it is terrible when I think even for a single moment over the back, dark background, which from the very earliest time was part of my life. So he struggled with this um, for most of his life, but he was able to journal through it. And his journals are very valuable um, philosophical texts in their own right. So he was able to produce something very useful even in that darkness when he didn't have the joy of heaven. Here's a poem by Charles Baudelaire called Spleen, or Selections from this poem, that seem to express this condition of acedia. 
When the low, heavy sky weighs like a lid on the groaning spirit, victim of long ennui, and from the all-encircling horizon spreads over us a day gloomier than the night, when the earth is changed into a humid dungeon in which hope, like a bat, goes beating the walls with her timid wings and knocking her head against the rotten ceiling, when the rain, stretching out its endless train, imitates the bars of a vast prison and a silent horde of loathsome spiders come to spin their webs in the depths of our brain. And without drums or music, long hearses pass by slowly in my soul. Hope, vanquished, weeps. And atrocious, despotic anguish on my bowed skull plants her black flag. That's pretty bad. (laughs) Better not end there. It's hard to say anything after reading that. um, That is so dark. But is it really, though? Because he's written this poem. Right? The poem itself is an achievement. It is an act of victory. So I don't think he's quite telling the truth when he says that hope is vanquished. Because if all hope were vanquished, he never would have come out of it to be able to construct this poem. And the very act of shaping his thoughts into the form of this poem is, I believe, an act of victory over anguish. And it's also um, worth noting, I think, that this poem occurs in the first section of his collection, Les Fleurs de Mal. And the other sections deal with other states of mind. So even in the book itself, you as the reader or the narrator of the poem, you move out of this state of acedia and into other conditions of mind. So it is also a temporary condition. A more contemporary poet, Sharon Dolan, was interviewed by Poetry Magazine. She had a series of poems, and here are a couple of phrases from one of her poems. She described acedia as roiling solitude, dank reclusion, a receding mirror of acedia, finding a way to find a way to want to find a way back into conversation. You want to want to want. And then the interviewer asked her if she could say a little bit more about acedia, and her answer was, acedia is a state of torpor from which these poems, and this one in particular, emerged. It is depressive sloth, a melancholic why bother state that even impedes writing or stops it altogether. But then notice this difference here. And yet I have found that writing about it or through it is the only way out of it. So it seems like she even went a step beyond Kierkegaard's journaling practice into writing poetry about the condition, and that was one way to get out of it. But there's another kind that's deeper and darker than acedia or melancholy, and that's doubt. That's a condition of mind that often grips a believer when we find ourselves unable to believe those very things that we've committed to, as if the very objects of worship that promise to be the source of meaning and hope stir also by their promise a sense of meaninglessness and despair. Kierkegaard, again, who seems to have experienced every kind of darkness at some stage or another in his life, wrote, my doubt is terrible, nothing can withstand it. It is a cursed hunger, and I can swallow up every argument, every consolation and sedative. I rush at 10,000 miles a second through every obstacle. Um, And as a side note, I've I've found that sometimes this is worst when you're actually studying those very texts that are supposed to be defending your faith and explaining your faith, that you find yourself able to rush through all of those obstacles. He means obstacles to doubt, right? Things that would prevent you from getting to doubt. Philip Helfer, in The Psychology of Religious Doubt, says that the religious doubter seeks an end to suffering, confusion, depression, emptiness, meaningless, those different kinds of darkness, lost identity, and more through a set of beliefs whose validity he questions, but he does not know where else to look. John Bunyan went through this kind of doubt, and reading his chief, uh, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners is an agonizing process because it takes you through all of his kinds of mental torment, some of which you feel like are so unnecessary and you wish you could just speak to him and help him. Um, but there was one particular, he went through many different phases like this, but there was one particular mental temptation that he felt like he was being tempted to, in his words, sell Christ. And this temptation was coming at him over and over and over again. And so finally he said he was just so tired that just for one brief second he just thought, well then let him go if he will. And then immediately he felt like that thought had been the unforgivable sin. And so what happened then was two years of tormenting thoughts, wondering if 
that brief little flash of a second had been the unforgivable sin. And so he wrote, I felt myself shut up into the judgment to come. Nothing now for two years together would abide with me but damnation and an expectation of damnation. I was both a burden and a terror to myself, as if racked upon the wheel. My torment would flame out and afflict me. Yes, it would grind me, as it were, to powder. So I only have a few things to say about doubt then that are even at all positive. Um, one is that at least he's not giving up the struggle, right? Um, someone who took his faith much less seriously would have just given up then and said, well then, I'm not a Christian. Maybe if I throw out the system, then I won't need to feel condemned because I'm no longer inside um, that system of salvation and condemnation. So that's one thought. Um, but from an artistic point of view, interestingly, Doubt is actually productive. Doubt actually contributes to the creation of many, many works of art. I just had a few sort of last minute thoughts about this, even on the way here today. Um, Tolkien writes that it's always much easier to write about the bad times than about the good times, right? When the hobbits reach Rivendell, they spend a good period of time there, but it's nothing but good food and drink and good songs and music. And he says, good things are easily told, quickly told. So if you are going through a terrible time of doubt, it's actually easier to write about and to create works of art about a terrible time for some reason. And then there are two sort of phases, uh, contemporary, that I think have taken this idea of doubt and sort of harnessed its creative power. There's a popular genre of narratives of deconversion right now, stories of the loss of faith um, and writing books and creating other works of art out of that. And then there's also a phase that maybe we're just coming out of, the New Atheist novel, sort of along with the New Atheist, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and so forth. There's also a sort of um, concomitant literary movement. You think of Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy. Brilliant, brilliant children's fantasy, but extremely disturbing for the, uh, you know, the message that it's getting across. So anyway, those would be sort of the results, the artistic results of someone who, who gave in to the doubt, whom the doubt conquered. But since we're more interested in looking at those who are remaining within the faith, then those don't really concern us so much right now. So that instead, there have been a few people who have tried to take their doubt into their system of belief. Instead of just getting rid of it and conquering it, or instead of giving in to it and letting it conquer them, they've tried to work it into their system. So, for instance, Paul Tillich wrote that doubt is not the opposite of faith. It is an element of faith. And guess who again? Kierkegaard. Um, famous for his leap of faith, he thought that the doubt was sort of a necessary context to be existing in. And then in that context, he writes, and so I say to myself, I choose. That historical fact, the fact of the life and death and resurrection of Christ, means so much to me that I decide to stake my whole life upon that if. This is called risking, and without risk, faith is an impossibility. A daily test is the trial of faith. So he saw the doubt as being something to face up to daily and being a test of faith. Now Charles Williams, um, who is the poet that I'm dedicated to studying, whose works I'm dedicated to studying, also was one who tried to bring doubt into his system of faith. So he was a poet, he was a professional editor with Oxford University Press, he was a member of the Inklings, uh, very good friends with C.S. Lewis, also a friend of T.S. Eliot. But interestingly, um, also a member of the Occult Secret Society, the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. So he was a person who lived a life of contained contradictions. Um, and he tried to bring doubt into his faith. He lived a life of active skepticism. Behind everything bad, he could see something good. But behind everything good, he could also see something bad. And if you were talking to him and having an argument, he would flip sides partway through to test it out and see what it was like on the other side. And so he would do this mentally with every sort of possible conversation. He would do this with belief as well. Well, let's just try out what unbelief would be like and feel, um, see what that was like. And he said that it's man's duty to question God. It's man's right, even man's duty to question God. And so he developed what he called the quality of disbelief. That's a sort of a necessary quality inside of faith. And like Kierkegaard, he said, no one can do more than decide what to believe. Now, Charles Williams also developed another very specific 
um, idea, an idea about a very specific kind of darkness or problem that people face. And I think it's unique to Williams, not unique, not the experience unique, but writing about it and theorizing about it this way, I think, is unique to Williams. He called it the crisis or the schism, and he used it as a literary theory. Okay, so I think that's what makes it unique. He said it's a psychological state when you exclaim at the same time, it cannot be, it is impossible, and yet it is. So he said you could experience this in your everyday life, for instance, with grief. When someone has died, you have this simultaneous, well, they can't be gone. You know, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that she's gone, and yet rationally you know that she is. Um, he said you can experience this in situations of romance, when you love someone and he doesn't love you back. Like, that's impossible that my love would not be returned because it's my whole universe. So you have this idea of this crisis or this schism where you are a split self. There are two things at once. But I said he used it specifically as a literary theory. So he thought that the greatest poets had to go through and face this crisis in their poetry. Not necessarily themselves as a human being, but as a poet, the persona had to go through it and face this crisis in poetry. So I think that's kind of what makes it unique. One of his later novels, Descent into Hell, features a very interesting personification or embodiment of this crisis of schism. The, the main character, Pauline, meets a doppelganger, a double of herself. So that's probably the clearest literary expression of a divided self, of two things simultaneously existing that are contradictions. And as it turns out, one is her glorified self and one is her sinful self. So the two selves meet each other. In his Arthurian poetry, which I believe is Charles Williams' masterpiece, he personifies this crisis in several different ways, but one that I'll deal with specifically has to do with Lancelot. Um, you may remember, it's different in various versions of the myth, but um, Lancelot sleeps with Elaine, thinking that she's Guinevere, wakes up in the morning and realizes that he's unfaithful on many levels, right? He's been unfaithful to his king, he's been unfaithful to his um, beloved you know, woman in this chivalric romance. So what happens in Charles Williams' myth is he turns into a wolf. All winter the wolf haunted the environs of Carbonek. Now what was left of the man's contrarious mind was twinned and twined with the beast's bent to feed. Man he hated, beast he hungered. Half man, half beast was Lancelot's form. So Lancelot is experiencing the schism within himself. Half of him is saying, I could never have done that. That's not who I am. I'm not the person who would betray my king and my queen. Well, and Elaine, by the way, but I don't think he's too concerned about her. Um, and my kingdom and so forth. And on the other hand, he knows rationally, I did this. I did this act, and it's going to have dreadful consequences. And so Williams expresses this by having him half man, half wolf. Williams expresses this later on as well in other ways. He shows it in the kingdom itself. Against the rule of the emperor, the indivisible empire was divided. Therefore, the Perusia suspended its coming and abode still in the land of the Trinity. Now, out of context, okay, even in context, these lines are a little hard to gloss, um, but the idea is that the kingdom is falling apart. Because of the sins of Lancelot, Guinevere, Arthur, Balin, Mordred, the kingdom is split into pieces. So there you get the idea of schism. But Williams is saying here in his mythology that there was an even more dreadful result. The second coming of Christ was postponed. It was supposed to happen in Arthur's kingdom, but because of their sins, it was put off. So that's the ultimate schism, is the division of humanity from their creator. Here's one more visual example for you of the idea of the schism. This is... Well, I'll explain what this is, but the novelist Kaim Potok has written what I consider the best novel on art, faith, and God. My name is Asher Lev. And so the schism is presented forward here in that the, um, the main character is split between his Orthodox Jewish identity and his gifts as an artist. Now, the novelist Kaim Potok is also a painter, so he has painted the work that appears in the novel as the climax of the book. So this painting is a result of Asher Lev's crisis of his division, and it presents the character's mother crucified and split between her son and his artistic gifts on the one hand and her husband and his um, ultra-Orthodox identity on the other. So here's a visual way of presenting the schism. And you see how this even, um, this even comes into the artistic technique that's chosen. 
right? By using a cubist approach, he's able to split the character in pieces and present the sides to us. So all these things sound so theoretical, but they are embodied forth even in the techniques that people use. But now moving on then, um, obviously that schism is not only productive of art, it has to be, and Williams even thinks that art will not be great unless it goes through that schism. But now we come to yet another, which is probably the darkest of all. The deepest and darkest is despair. If someone doesn't make it through the melancholy, the acedia, the doubt, and so forth, they might fall into a black despair, which the Catholic encyclopedia tells us is actually a sin that it's the voluntary and complete abandonment of all hope of saving one's soul, a positive act of the will by which a person deliberately gives over any expectation of ever reaching eternal life. And obviously by positive there, it doesn't mean good, it means active on your part, intentionally choosing to believe that one will not be saved and maybe even going a step further and saying God is not capable of fulfilling the promises that he has put forward. So that is despair. Um, many artists have faced this despair, sometimes with fatal consequences. It's possible that maybe Vincent van Gogh went through this, maybe Tolstoy at various stages in his life, and possibly the poet Anne Sexton before her suicide. So this poem, Sickness Unto Death, occurs in her book, That Awful Rowing Toward God. God went out of me, as if the sea dried up like sandpaper, as if the sun became a latrine. God went out of my fingers, they became stone. I did not see the speechless clouds, I saw only the little white dish of my faith breaking in the crater. I who wanted to crawl toward God could not move nor eat bread, so I ate myself, bite by bite. Many famous composers have gone through periods of despair, Schubert, in 1828, wrote to a friend, Imagine a man whose health will never recover and whose despair makes things worse rather than better. Each night when I go to sleep, I hope never to wake again, and each morning serves only to recall the misery of the day before. And yet, in that very year, he plunged into one of his most creative periods ever, one of his most productive periods, and produced some of the most heartrendingly beautiful music that has ever been written. Not all of it was gloomy either and melancholy. There were some that had um, dirges or funeral sections, but also some glorious pieces of music that, don't, that are not tinged at all by the darkness of his despair. Beethoven went through periods of despair as well, especially in 1832 and he wrote, uh, sorry, 1802, right? When he wrote um, the letter to his brother about losing his hearing, but he came raging out of it into some of his most famous pieces that seemed to be defiant in the face of despair. Franz Liszt also went through a phase of despair in which he contemplated suicide and wrote, my pen is paralyzed, but he turned to his Catholic faith um, and rejected the despair and rejected the possibility of suicide. Now, um, I have a piece of music by Liszt here. Hopefully this video is going to work when I click over to it. And, um, it's called the Zardas Macabre, and it comes from one of his phases of despair. And when I listen to it, I don't hear the despair. I hear the victory over it. I hear coming out of it. It's four and a half minutes long. I thought it would actually be good to just listen to the whole thing. You can get a little break from my voice and have a little mini concert. So I'll put the volume back on, and then we'll see what happens when I click. It's a dark night after all. Okay. Well, what I can do is I can just switch over and just show you the video separately. So just chill out for just a second. <laughs> 
I said, when I listen to that, I don't hear Franz Liszt in despair. I hear him conquering it and coming out of it and saying, you know, I have decided, um, well, we're going to see in a minute, not to choose not to be um, and able to compose that gorgeous music throughout it. But then we come to one specific kind um, that's the name of the talk, desolation, is actually not a generic term for all these different things, but it's actually a very specific term that St. Ignatius Loyola developed in his book, The Spiritual Exercises. And the Spiritual Exercises was actually a practical manual um, that people were supposed to go through when they were in training in Ignatian spirituality in order to be priests or monks. And it was divided into different weeks, and there were certain spiritual exercises to practice every week. And in the very first week, he talks about desolation. And it is a darkness of soul, disturbance in it, the unquiet of different agitations and temptations. It is a want of confidence without hope, without love, all lazy, tepid, sad, and as if separated from his creator and Lord. Now that sounds very, very similar to some of the ones we've talked about previously, especially melancholy and acedia. But Ignatius was specifically talking about cycles of consolation and desolation. And it could be caused by sin, or it could be sent by God to test us or to give us a true acquaintance and knowledge that all is the gift and grace of God our Lord. So the idea there being when we enter into a cycle of consolation, a cheerful time, that we don't take it for granted. And so the idea there was that um, the people who were practicing the exercises, the exhortants, would actually go through these phases um, almost on a predictable basis as they examined themselves and went through their sins and tried to get to know the Lord better. Now, Gerard Manley Hopkins was trained in Ignatian spirituality, and towards the end of his life, he wrote the six terrible sonnets that really express all of these different phases. And I probably could have just stood up here and read you his six sonnets and sat down. I would have been through sort of the entire range of all of this. Um, but here's a particular one that he wrote, that Hopkins wrote in a time of great desolation. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day, what hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. What sights you, heart, saw, ways you went. And more must, in yet longer light's delay. With witness I speak this. But where I say hours, I mean years, mean life. And my lament is cries, countless cries, like dead letters sent to dearest him that lives, alas, away. I am gall, I am heartburn, God's most deep decree bitter would have me taste. My taste was me. Bones built in me, flesh filled, blood brimmed the curse. Self-yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours. I see the lost are like this, and their scourge to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. So when he's in this phase of desolation, he doesn't see it as just one stage in a cycle, right? Because he says... I think it's going to last for hours, and when I say hours, I mean years, and when I say years, I mean my whole life. So this particular sonnet doesn't have a whole lot of hope in it, except the very, very slight suggestion that the damned in hell are actually a little worse off. Seems to be the only sort of positive view that he has here. But he doesn't stay there either. Um, he goes on to express this desolation in other poems, and then some of them move out of the period of desolation, like the psalmist did in Psalm 130. Not, I'll not carry in comfort despair, not feast on thee, not untwist slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can, can something, hope, wish, day come, not choose not to be. But ah, but oh thou terrible, why must thou rude on me thy ring-world right foot rock? Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, oh, in turns of tempest, me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. And notice that the thee throughout there is despair, whom he's addressing with a capital D. But then he asks why. But before I get to the why, I just want to make sure everyone understands this image here, because it's so beautiful and complicated. He's saying, I am heaped there. So he is as a heap of chaff there. And the despair is um, a turn of tempest, is a whirlwind, a tornado coming into his little heap of chaff to disperse it. But he asks why, in order that my chaff might fly and my grain lie sheer and clear. So he's starting to see purpose in it here, right? Um, and actually, at the end, he finally calls it that night, that year of now done darkness. 
So in this one, he does come out of that phase. And again, like I said before, even the writing of a poem is a victory. The capturing of it to be able to share it with others, the victory over the words and the darkness itself. And then finally, the one that's actually called The Dark Night of the Soul um, by St. John of the Cross in the work of that title. This is a time in which God strips their faculties, affections, and feelings, both spiritual and sensual, both outward and inward, leaving the understanding dark, the will dry, the memory empty, and the affections in the deepest affliction, bitterness, and constraint. But here's specifically, here's a drawing um, by St. John, but specifically in this time, it is sent to accomplish sanctification. So this is the one that's the most specifically, according to these writers, um, the one that God sends in order to make us love him more and in order to make us more holy. God sets them in this night only to prove them and to humble them. It is a purgation, first of the senses and then of the soul. It is bitter and terrible to sense. It is horrible and awful to the spirit. So what about creativity in the dark night of the soul? Okay, so maybe it's a necessary stage to go through for sanctification, to know God more and love him more. But while you're in it, St. John says that it is so difficult to describe and to expound. While someone is blundering in that darkness, imagination and fancy can find no support in any meditation. Yeah, but he wrote this, right? So the idea then is he didn't write it at the time. He writes it as one looking back who has thought about this dark night, and so he's looking at it back in retrospect. And interestingly, um, the dark night of the soul, both the concept and the words to the poem on which St. John based his meditation have been very inspirational and have been set to music many times. Here are just the first few stanzas of his poem. Um, Upon a darkened night, the flame of love was burning in my breast, and by a lantern bright, I fled my house while all in quiet rest. Shrouded by the night and by the secret stair, I quickly fled. The veil concealed my eyes while all within lay quiet as the dead. And now look at the positive way that he addresses the night here. O night, thou was my guide. O night, more loving than the rising sun. O night that joined the lover to the beloved one, transforming each of them into the other. And I had a musical setting of, of it for you, but we'll skip over that. And if you want to listen to it later, we can. So then what good are all these labels, right? So I've gone through and I've told you all these different kinds and their different names and their different categories. Is that any help? Does it make any difference? Not really. They're all complicated together. You could hear I was repeating a lot of the same language. And does my dividing them off from mental illness really help? Maybe not. Even St. John himself wrote that a dark night of the soul might come from some bad humor or indisposition of the body. So just when we thought we'd got them separated out, right, that these are of the soul and these are of the body, they get all complicated together again. So I really think that I've just raised more questions than I've answered and maybe caused more problems than I've solved. And here are a few other problems, in case we don't have enough. If there is a God gene, as has recently been suggested, right, a specific point on our DNA that enables us to be people of faith or not, right, well then maybe there's a doubt gene, too. So maybe we don't have any choice about whether we believe or not. Maybe it's just in our biology or it isn't. Maybe John Calvin was onto something much more like biology than theology. And then in that case, why would God give the same person the faith gene and the doubt gene and then maybe the artistic gene on top of it? That seems kind of like a recipe for lifelong misery. Here's another problem. It has to do with our decisions versus what providence is trying to tell us in these times. So I'm a literary scholar. I'm trained to read texts and interpret them and analyze them. But I've also been trained to read everything else as well, to interpret everything else as if it's a text. So with my hard-earned and expensive literary lenses, I go around reading movies, TV shows, billboards, advertisements, people's clothing, and interpreting them and analyzing them in the same sort of cultural analysis that I do to books and poetry and so forth. So then how do I read an event, right? I try to make sense out of what happens to me. I try to interpret it like a story and then analyze it and find meaning in it. So when I'm put into a dark night of the soul, I don't know how to interpret it. I don't know whether it's a sign from God saying stop. You're not good enough at this. This isn't what I made you for. You need to find something else to do. This isn't your calling. Or when it's a sign from God saying, try harder. Don't be a lazy bum. Get up off your bed and just work harder. Do more. So I really don't know how to interpret 
these events when they come. And I had a little personal story to tell you about it, but I'll wait and see if you want to ask me about it later in the interests of time. Now, of course, there are also kinds of darkness that just come from circumstances, types of grief and painful times that just come from external, what's going on outside of us. The New York artist Makoto Fujimura, who's one of our greatest living artists, has been tried in the furnace of our times. He lived in Lower Manhattan on September 11th, and then he just recently lost over 70 paintings to the floods of Hurricane Sandy. And yet, in all of this, he's able to come through and paint such beautiful works as Zero Summer, which is glossed by lines from T.S. Eliot, where now is the, unimag the unimaginable zero summer? And when I look at this painting, I see two things at the same time, whether he put them in or not. I see the terror of falling towers, but I also see the golden beauty of unassailable grace. And there's one other piece of hope or idea that I want to leave you with, and that is that even in the darkest times, we can remember that God himself went through the desolation of the cross. This is The Crowning by Bruce Herman. And Bruce wrote about this painting that when you think about the crucifixion, it's amazing to ponder that it wasn't just an appearance. It wasn't just God, you know, pretending to be flesh. Um, it wasn't just a deus ex machina coming in and just tidying things up. It was an actual deadly encounter of God with sin. And he writes, it's hard to wrap our minds around the fact that God actually died as a result of that encounter but that that's not the end of the story. And even in the moment of desolation on the cross, when Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was, of course, just speaking forth what was happening to him. He was also quoting Psalm 22. So he was fulfilling prophecy. But furthermore, he was using the words of a poem. He was using the words of a poet who was also in a period of darkness. So I don't know if any of that might be encouraging or not, but perhaps it is. And Nietzsche wrote, one must still have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. Thank you. <laughs>